Paul became a woman of rupture in human history. Of how and when deliverance became congealed into anti black racism. And then how this, that particular moment of congealment is circled around the question about humor, about who and what is a human. In my concluding remarks, I put all of this together in a mix not just about the historical making of the modern world, but about the present. So let me begin with slavery and the slave trade. The figures are well known for the Atlantic slave trade. Estimations range about 12 million Africans were taken in over 35,000 voyages across the Atlantic from South Africa to so-called New World at the time. Many European nations were involved in this Atlantic trade, and indeed there were about six colonial European colonial empires. The English, the French, the Portuguese and the Spanish who were first out of the block and were pioneers of this activity, the Dutch and the Danish. The slave trade was a, and slavery was a complex economic and social as well as cultural phenomenon. The trade, as we now know, perfected accounting systems of the time. It was a global economic system, though, not simply an Atlantic trade. It involved the Indian Ocean, it involved the Northern Atlantic, and it involved the Southern Atlantic. This is the recent map of UNESCO about the overview of the trade from 1500 to 1900s. I mean, you notice that it is uh, that what, what we always like to think about is this the Northern Atlantic. What is important to also think about the Southern, Southern Atlantic, Atlantic trade. That is the trade between, particularly, Brazil and Africa. And in the trade between Brazil and Africa, two countries are important, the Portuguese and the Dutch. And then there's the Indian Ocean trade, which is also going across sometimes to the southern Atlantic. Therefore, what you are looking at in this map is a trade that was not just Atlantic, as you might think, but it was a trade, in fact, that was very much a part of the world system. If you take the biography, of a particular Portuguese trader, a man by the name of Jose Antonio Pereira. This is who was born in Lisbon and who was involved both in the Atlantic slave trade as well as the Haitian textile, that is the textiles trade in, in, in India, and the way in which he linked that textile trade to Angola and also the Brazilian spirits and European goods and then brought slaves from from Africa to Brazil, then we will see that what you're looking at, if you look at the biography of the Pereira, is it in fact an one entrepreneur who is Portuguese, but who had relationships both with the American traders as well as with the Dutch traders. What you are seeing is that they were, you are looking at a world system. That is fascinating to think about the trade in textile, the trade in spirits, the trade in European goods. And this particular gentleman, as an entrepreneur from Portugal, this one particularly is where it comes from, is involved in all of this particular, in all of these circuits of trade. Now, what made this particular trade, Atlantic South, the slave trade, and slavery itself, distinct from other forms of slavery and trade in human history? And what is it that made it a global business? In the first instance, I think that it's important to understand the distinction of the Atlantic and slavery in this particular, this particular moment of history, as the 1450s and 1600s, as really a global enterprise. And that as a global enterprise, it that made it distinct from other forms of slavery in human history. Secondly, slavery previously in all forms of human societies circulated around questions of death peonage and questions of war. In Europe, as Christianity became the major religion, 
and the mark of the human, there was the move to reduce the enslavement of Europeans. And there was a move to think about difference as Christianity became important in, between Jews and Muslims. That is, Christian as one mark of, and then other religions, so Jews and Muslims, as another part of another mark. And therefore, there's a way in which to think about this business of slavery and what begins to make slavery different is what were the markers that then began to organize itself around the human difference. And the shift, therefore, from religion, which is whether you're Jews or whether you're Muslims and whether you're Christian, into the business of scale. In Africa, the markers of difference were circled around questions of status and of ethnic groups. And it is also very important here to think about a certain kind of historical account, particularly in Western, West Central Africa and its own political history, whereby about 1070, many of the kingdoms in West Central Africa were becoming Muslim. And how, in fact, that becoming of Muslims in Central, in, in West Africa, West, and West Central Africa, played a significant role in thinking about the a way in which slavery was organized, particularly the Atlantic slave trade. The historian Paul Lovejoy has made an argument that this particular emergence of Muslims in West Muslim religion in Central and West Central Africa has made, made it, was a constraint, he argues, against the Atlantic slave system. But then let us go back to this question of difference. So when the markers of difference become part of the human classificator system, when did that particular thing happen? To answer that question, we leave Europe for a moment and go to the new world in quotation marks to the Americas. The Colombian voyages of the 1490s opened up, as the Caribbean theorists in the winter, winter argues, a certain kind of historical moment. She argues, and here I quote her, that the, the Portuguese dispatching, the, dispatching in the first half of the 15th century suffered several expeditions where whose objectives were to find the find the boundary marker, she says, between what she called then the habitable, habitable temperate zone of Europe and the unhabitable current zone, she says, created a new historical moment. The Portuguese in, 14, in the 1441, she said, landed in Senegal. That particular landing, she argues, destroyed the actual Greek and Roman conceptions of geography. But there was something else that was destroyed, I would argue. I would argue that it was not just the European conceptions of geography that was destroyed with, the Columbia, with both first the Portuguese voyages and then the Colombian voyages. That what also was destroyed was a certain way in which we thought of ourselves or what we thought about ourselves. The encounter of the peoples, of new peoples in, in the new world, and the creation, if you wish, of what Anthony Paxton has called the fall of natural man, and the origins of what he says is a comparative ethnology, that that particular fall of natural man created a certain basis of thinking and a certain conceptualization of thinking about, quite frankly, who were humans and who were not people. The idea of natural man at the time was that this was somebody who lived outside of the human community. In these societies, the inhabitants were less than human, it was argued, cutting themselves off from the means which God had granted to man to achieve a telos. I think that we want to pay some attention to that. In other words, an understanding of natural man as someone who cuts off him or herself from human community, but is cut off themselves from human community and is then unable to do what? Is unable, therefore, to achieve a certain telos that God has asked them to achieve as human beings. And therefore, what you are then thinking about, what you should be thinking about in that is specific kind of moment is the way in which, therefore, constructions of the human are then now shifted, are still mired in old notions of Christianity, who is Christian and who is not Christian, that God becomes a very important understanding of this person who is human and who is not human, whether or not you are a certain kind of Christian. 
But what is also very important is that you are one who also has to begin to think as to how all these ideas about natural history and natural science then that itself gets remapped later on in the actual in the actual slave and slave trade. In 1774, there is a particular Jesuit priest whose name is Father Pedro Alonso, and he wrote a particular book about the conquest of the Indians. And he argues that the conquest of the Indians, he says, in 1700s, really says confirms all the vague future of the imaginary spaces of man. The colonial ent entrance to therefore of the new world generated new schemas of human classification. Not just in the 1700s, but from as early as the 1590s. In the 1590 there is another Jesuit. And those of you who some of you may know my background as someone who went to one of these Catholic schools and almost became a Jesuit. And therefore, one of the preoccupations that I have um, in my own intellectual life is actually mapping the ways in which the Jesuits Again, who were the Spanish, uh, uh, Spanish priests who came to the New World, how they began to see and how they wrote what they wrote, what they wrote and what they saw. So that in the 1590s, Jose de Costa, who wrote a very important book called The Natural and the Moral History of the Indies, not only talked about the flora and the fauna and the animals in which he saw, but also, in fact, developed a classificatory schema of the human. And this is how we saw it. Non-Europeans, yeah, sorry, Europeans, yeah, is, are people who essentially have writing systems, customs, and government. Non-European people, the yeah, and this is as early as 1590s, have no systems of writing, no customs, and no particular government. He then began to give us a list of people in a, some kind of schema. Europeans, he says, are at the top followed by Chinese, followed by the chiefdoms of the Aztecs, the Aztec Mayas in the New World, followed by, uh, by, by people he called Malayans, right? Um, who I think he means, what he think, I think he means is, is quote unquote brown people, and then followed by Africans Yagas, who were no <coughs> hunters and gatherers. What is interesting, though, is that in deploying the word, in deploying Afri the word African, or talking about Africans, he does not call them Africans, he calls them Ethiopians. And I want you to hold on to that, because one of the arguments I'm going to be making in this talk is the way in which the word Ethiopian becomes transformed into Negro. And that at the moment of that transformation, certain things are happening which rupture a certain way of thinking about, the, about questions of difference. The particular classificator scheme of people like Mr. Jose de Costa, Mr. Jose de Costa really becomes consolidated and congealed in the Enlightenment with the work of people of the natural, like natural historians of fun, and in Germany with the work of Johann Bommelbach. Buffon has been all wrote 36 volumes between 1749 and 1788 about natural history, which included the natural history of the human. He believed in monogenesis, but he also believed that is that we all come from one God, but he also had a second belief which was important, and that is the belief in the degeneration of races. So in other words, what is interesting is that you can come from one God, but if you have an idea that races are able to degenerate, then in fact you can have a position therefore where some races are degenerated. And so that what you have to ask yourself, what are the set of conditions and contexts for a, a race to degenerate? Moving back as we know in 1779, in a, in a set of researches which inaugurates a certain kind of colonial anthropology, wasn't necessarily in Britain, about the craniums, begin to think about the human species and five races. The Caucasian race, the Mongolian race, the, Af the, the Ethiopian race, the American race, and here it means the Greek Colombian, the Malayan race, and here it means brown people. And that all and what is that, and, and as a part of the classifications about human beings. What I think is fascinating and important to understand here is the context of all of this. 
All of these work of human classification takes place in a colonial context and in the context of racial slavery and of the slave trade. What is of work here, therefore, is the business of the colonial situation. And what is that, and the way in which that colonial situation, therefore, rearranges what is supposed to be a human science of classification, not into a human science of the human being and in our history, but actually into racial typologies. So what is fascinating is that coming out of the Enlightenment is not a classification system about us as human, but actually a classification system that is based upon racial typologies. So let us move from that to begin to think through this business of the colonial situation. And let us talk a little bit and talk and spend a little time, tarry if you wish, on this idea of the colonial situation. Conventional discussions of the colonial situation essentially argue that the colonial problem revolves around the following things. A certain kind of political and external control of the country also involved, revolves around the insertion of a particular country within the Western economic system. And it also involves and circles around what I like to call the creation of the native. And this is very important because the, there is no native that is created as a figure in human history until there is a colonial. So that then you have who is a native and who is not a native. Native doesn't become somebody who is born there. The native becomes within the colonial understanding of history and within, within the entire colonial project as somebody who is actually um, colonized and who is in, in, in the end con con uh, conquered. I want to argue that there is a, also a very important thing about colonial, the colonial situation. And it is a way in which the colonial situation and the colonial powers map and think about difference. How to deal with difference? What to do about difference? How do you conceptualize difference and therefore develop schemas of thought and practices around this business of difference? It is actually very interesting to note that at the beginning of the colonial project in the, 14, in the 1400s, that the, the notion of the Latin word terra nullis, which means empty lands, by the time you get to the 1800s, and the colonial project in Africa with the struggle for Africa, terra nullis does not only now mean empty lands, but means populations not organized. And populations that organized, I would add, in a European model. At the heart, therefore, of the colonial project, I would argue, is this business of taking possession. Taking possession is about violence. Taking possession is obviously about pacification. But taking possession, to take possession, is in fact, I would argue, a specific kind of encounter. It is a kind of something, it is a kind of human activity, a kind of practice to possess another. And to possess another, I would argue, is perhaps one of the most insidious forms of domination. The other question to ask ourselves is this business of colonialism and capitalism. What forms of labor? Firstly, we would want to then we would want to think about and try to think about this project of colonialism. That at the heart of the colonial project were plantations. Whether those plantations were in in the Spanish America, that is the mines in Latin American places like Peru, the plantations in the Caribbean, or the plantations in, in Africa or indeed plantations on in, uh, plantations in, in, in Asia. There were, in fact, I would want to argue, six kind of, and, and of uh, six kind of ways to think about this business of labor, colonialism, and capitalism. Firstly, that this was slave labor, or indentured forms of labor. Certainly, secondly, that there was a certain kind of, if you wish, demographic inefficiency to all of this. Thirdly, that which required therefore a certain the trade to actually kick on one and keep on reproducing this kind of labor, whether it was slave labor or indentured labor. Thirdly, that was large scale production in these plantations, anywhere between 50 to 500 workers, 
that there was also a, a way in which at the level of governmentality, that is the level of rule on these plantations themselves, that the plantations were subject essentially to the whim and fancies of the plantation uh, of the plantation owner. And that also that these plantations were organized all, all the time to supply a set of markets. We can understand these things, both in relationship to colonialism and to slavery. When obviously we look at the history of the VOC in this country or the history of the West Indies uh, companies in this, uh, in this country. The VOC, as we know, was formed in 1602 and by about 1611 had posted in places like Jakarta in Indonesia. The West Indies uh, Company, as we know, formed a little later, 1675, was partly responsible for the slave trade. We will also, we should remember something I think that I don't can't seem to forget, that the 1602 VOA, by the time we went to 1652, were the people who were, were, were in South Africa. Now, Mr. Van Riebeck landed in South Africa and landed, quite frankly, in a set full of Angola slaves. And that in all of this, it was a question of the plantation. So if you look at this, this is actually a plantation in the late 1600s, or the 1700s, in Bengali. It is a VOC plantation. So again, to essentially repeat, what we are here and what we are looking at is a world system, a system of European colonies. And I would argue, therefore, that no telling of European history without the telling of this colonial story is, in fact, an accurate, can, can give us an accurate and meaningful history uh, today. But I want to return to this question of the colonial and race, because it is very troubling. And what is fascinating to me about this story, um, and a lot of my colleagues, <laughs> is the way in which people then talk about colonialism and talk about slavery, but then elide race. As if somehow that this doesn't, this is not matter or is really a secondary or epiphenomenal matter in thinking about questions of colonialism and racial and slavery. What I would want to do when in thinking around this question of the question of colonial difference, it is very important to think of a particular debate in Spain in 1553, a debate in which the Stubler and the, the, Jesuit, the Dominican friar, Bartholomew, Bartholomew de las Casas, argue about the, in the indigenous people in America. The argument was simply this, done in Latin for three days, was simply this, did the indigenous people have souls? If they had souls and then unbaptized, could you then treat them in the way that the Spanish did? Or did they not have souls? Because if they did not have souls, then they could be treated anyway. Which again comes back to what I'm saying, that underneath all of these assumptions are the question of who and what is a, who and what is a human being. What is interesting in the debate is that when, the, when Mr. Las Casas, or the Friar Las Casas, begins to feel that he's losing the debate, that somehow the scribble on the third day is, is, is doing very well. Nobody's sleeping for, you know, for three days and nights or so the debate goes in Latin. He then argues in the debate that what we should what we should need to, what we now need to do, he says, is to bring the Negroes and to make them slaves in the Americas. And it's that then he regrets making that statement. But what to me is important is that that particular argument of bringing in the Negro as a slave then, in fact, begins to point to us a certain ways in which there was a shift that was beginning to take place between those parts of the African people who were considered first Ethiopians, this is what they were called, to now this construction of the Negro. So what we are seeing here in that particular debate in the 1553 is the beginning of the, or the announcement of the remarking of difference and blackness becoming a permanent marker with whiteness as its opposite. And I want to spend some time about thinking this business of blackness as a permanent marker within capitalism and within slavery. And I want to do that 
by just quickly reviewing again a theorist, a Caribbean theorist, Sylvia Winters, in an unpublished manuscript called Black Metamorphosis. What does Winter argue in this particular manuscript? Firstly, she argues that she is written in the 19, late 60s, early 70s, so that she's using the word Negro. Firstly, she argues that the Negro, she says, is a commodity. Secondly, she argues, and sometimes she can moves between blacks and Negro, that the black is seen as a tabla rather. Thirdly, she argues that the black person is seen as property. And therefore, she argues that alienation <coughs> is not about an individual alienation, but actually an alienation that has to do with race. And fourthly, she argues the black is seen, or the Negro, that has to use her words, is seen as a figure of black. I want to complicate this particular, those four particular points of, of, of Professor Winter by arguing the following, by suggesting that in all of these things, what we are seeing is this movement from Ethiopia, the classification of movement from Ethiopians to Negro. And that the construction of the so-called Negro at this time really as a being of inferior lack. This is really very, very important. Can be seen in a particular work by an English author, Anton Troller, who writes a book about Creole, about the West Indies, but also writes four volumes on South Africa. And what is interesting is that Trollope makes a distinction between what he calls Creole Negroes and Africans. And his argument is that Creole Negroes are okay because they have had 300 years living with white people, particularly the British, in the, in the, in the British Islands. But that the Africans are barbarians and savages because they have not had that, if you want to, that good fortune. And so that what is interesting to me is that even in the ways in which when Negroes are the figure of the Negro is seen as an inferior lack, then what happens is that there is gradations about this. And so those who are close to Europe or who are close to British and have lived under British rule for some time are okay, capable of tutelage, and those who haven't, like those in Africa on the African continent, are considered barbarians. Yet there is something that is important here that we need to think about. And that is the actual construction of the figure of the Negro in Western thought then becomes a actual part of a dominant imaginary <coughs> about blackness. And that death becomes the, the, the imaginary about blackness. Then in fact marks a certain complexity about this figure. And that the complexity about this figure is that this figure now becomes a figure that once you see him or her, you know what that person is. In other words, that person no longer has an interiority or a life. That person can only has a figure as a black figure, now only has a understanding or, or only allows you to have an external understanding which comes out of history. It is a, the way I sometimes like to put it, is a, is a way in which the visual grammar of the skin gives us a way to know somebody without you having to actually know them in any shape or form. But it is a complex thing. It is not just something that is there on the dominant side. Because on the other side, I would want to argue, not in a kind of, on, on, not in a kind of seamless dialectic, if you wish, but on the other side, there's a way in which blackness also becomes a, for the black person a way to work through his or own, or her own humanity. In other words, <laughs> that blackness also becomes a form of working beyond the Negro. But all of this becomes quite frankly to be something else. What all of this relates to, I would want to suggest here, is a certain kind of historical understanding between race, colonialism, and, and questions of slavery. So that in trying to think through these questions of the Negro, and therefore trying to think through this question of blackness, what we are trying to think about is how blackness becomes this permanent marker. And as it becomes this permanent marker, what, it, what actually happens, both historically and in the contemporary moment. Let me just again just carry here a while. 
Let us just look at the laws that comes out of slavery and colonialism that think through some of these questions. We can talk about the Virginia laws, and we can talk about the Dutch relationship to Virginia, because the first Africans landed in Jamestown in 1619. They were bought by a Dutch ship. So that we can, that, that, that we can talk about. We can also begin to think about the ways in which in the Virginia laws, questions of indentured servitude are, are then moved along and pushed open to begin to think about questions of slavery. We can also think about the court noir of the French. But since I'm, in, since I'm here, what I want to talk about just for a bit is to think through the actual, some of the laws of Suriname. There were 1,400 slave regulations in Suriname in the, from the 50s of 1700s until the end of slavery in the 1860s. And I just want to read for you a couple of the slave regulations. One slave regulation banned the intercourse explicitly between white women and Negroes. This is print, and this was promulgated January 28, 1711. This is what it says. Intercourse, not just meaning sex, between white women and Negroes is officially banned. That's it, that's, that's the regulation. So what are you seeing here? You are seeing a construction of whiteness and blackness. When a Negro is caught breaking this law, he would be executed. White men face different sentences. If she's unmarried, he says, the law says, she should be whipped and banned from the colony for life. And here I think now they're speaking explicitly about sexual abuse. My women have the, should get the same punishment. But in addition, the law says they should also be branded. So I want you to, to, to think about a regulation of 1711 that, that begins to think through questions of both, both social but also sexual intercourse and what and how you treat the people who are involved. And what does it mean to break that law? And what is the law attempting to do? Not just congene indifference, but making it impossible for any relationships between, between uh, people. The other part of the law, this is not just for white people. White contract workers, that is people who are bring, brought to the colonies from the Netherlands, are prohibited from trading and interacting in slave, with slaves without prior permission of the owner. The law prohibits relationships between female slaves, enslaved native Syrians and whites. Relations between white contracted workers and free native Surinamese, meaning free black slaves, that's what that phrase means, is see, is an infraction. So what you are then saying is that so this is part, this part of the regulation is the way in which, again, what? Not just difference, but how whiteness and blackness are constructed. And what is and what is what and what what does it mean to actually be engaged in a set of relationships, like you could have multiple normal relationships between people. This is the construction of the labor. This is the moment, therefore, in well, what I'm arguing is that racial slavery then constructs this labor. And what I'm arguing, put it in a nutshell, is that what you have on the, on the European colonialism and racial slavery is that you actually have a rupture. In it, and that rupture is that no longer do you think about people and difference according to religion, but you actually begin to think about it to according to a typology of race. And it is that typology of race I would want to suggest to you that is haunts that that haunts that haunts us uh, that haunts us to be. I argue that racial can give you some of the features of slavery. But I'm also going to suggest to you that there are other features that are important. 
One, that slavery is a system of what a Jamaican uh, social historical sociologist called a system of social death, but I would add to that a system of civil death. Now, obviously, it is a system of violence, but also, very importantly, that is a system of what I call a process of double commodification. That is, is a system in which a person is a property in person. This is this is a phrase of Elsa Kobaya, a West Indian historian, character historian from Ghana. And what she means here is really, I think, very important for us to tease out it for a few minutes. Firstly, that we all say that slaves actually produce goods. We all then say almost separately from that that the slaves themselves were things. But what happens if you put those two things together? What, what happens if you put the fact that the slave was a thing, was a property in the person? That is only a move under the arbitrary will of the master. Could be done with anything. It was not a subject according to the law. Both the English law, the Dutch law, the Spanish law, and the French law was a thing drawn primarily from Roman law and from English common law. But also then to say that it is not just person, not just a thing, i.e. a commodity, but it's also a property in person, because being a person means that the property of the person is a human being. So that you have to have a particular process where you turn that particular human being into a property of in person. So that particular process, I would want to argue, is a process of commodification. But then you have the person producing a commodity. So what you therefore have is a process of double commodification. And it is that process I would want to argue of the double commodification that is an extraordinary process, again, in human, in human history, and which creates a certain kind of set of ideas about human beings and about the possibilities of what is it the human being can be. Now, if we move fast forward to the 1940s, come out of certain kind of, come out of the 15th and 16th centuries, and begin to look at the historiography of slavery, we would see that by the 1940s, 1944 in particular, another character in person, Eric Williams, writes that slavery was, in his words, becomes a catalyst for the Industrial Revolution. He, quite frankly, is not the first person to have done that. In 1935, there's a book by W.B. Du Bois, an African-American historian, a book is called Black Reconstruction, in which he argues the very same things for the American, for the American system. But what is interesting, whether it is Du Bois or whether it is Eric Williams, is that the argument about the relationship between slavery and capitalism really flattens the so-called argument about the history of capitalism that argues that capitalism has to have a period of primitive accumulation. What the argument basically does is that it actually also complicates our understanding that capitalism as a social system needs free labor. And that exploitation as free wage labor is the heart of the system. What the argument therefore does is to not now talk about capitalism and industrial revolution, but actually begins to think about capitalism in a much earlier phase, and begin to think about what it is that is, cap that, that, that is happening at e as what one would call material provision in an economic life, and economic ways of producing, and how those things are deeply connected both to colonialism and to slavery. And if they are deeply connected to colonialism and slavery, then primitive accumulation really does not exist. But what you have are different forms of capitalism that are operating at different historical, at different historical periods. It therefore means this, that the conventional understanding of slavery as both simply dependency and exploitation is a little off the map. That the way in which people think about racial slavery is that it was a form of dependency and it was a form of labor exploitation. If one is arguing that you get a process of double commodification, if one is arguing that you get a process of social and civil death, then what one is talking about, therefore, are not systems of exploitation and dependency, but what you are talking about is the way in which the system, which inaugurates the new world, and it inaugurates modernity, is actually a system of domination. And as a system of domination, 
if they constitute, they constitute itself in certain relations of domination that some would, have, some would say is almost total. Because at the heart of that system of the voice we would make clear to us is not just anti black racism, but it's the way in which he says the arbitrary will of the master controls the class. And that arbitrary will of the master, I would have argued recently, really means that the black lives does not matter. So when black lives say black lives matter, and the movement says black lives matter, it is against a certain historical arbitrariness which today still, in fact, is part of the contemporary process of thinking about, um, thinking about society. I have presented here, uh, in brief, an argument about the constitution of the modern world. Let me summarize some of his points. James talks about the French Revolution as, about, as a revolution of citizenship, of liberty, of equality, and of fraternity. Of fraternity. Those of us who come from the United States think about the American Revolution as a form of political equality. Those of us who live in this part of the world, in the Netherlands, think about the Dutch Republicanism, in which the question of liberty was co-joined sovereignty. We think about Juan Lewis's statement about Republican government as a true liberty. What I have attempted to do here briefly is to point to something else, to point to an underside. The point to the underside of modernity, not as a kind of aberration, but as the foundation and therefore of, of, of the modern world. And therefore, to suggest to you that the modern world was founded in a deep unfreedom. And that deep unfreedom had to do with colonialism, racial slavery, and a form of capitalism which was dependent upon unfree labor. It means, therefore, in my view, that we do not live in a post-colonial past of Europe. That in fact, that, is, that we live in a process that is still decolonizing, that is still undergoing uh, itself. That the decolonization process, which begins in 1945, and I will then remind you, is not yet therefore 100 years old, and therefore is a very short span of time in human history, compared to four or five hundred years of colonial rule and of forms of, uh, of, of racial slavery, means that Europe is still caught within, if you wish, the whirlwind, within the matrices of this particular book of this kind of what some people call coloniality. The history of colonial empires is in, in Europe continues to be what I would argue are sedimented deposits of human history. And so in thinking about the sedimented deposits, that we then move to make some concluding remarks. At the present moment, there is what we in modest and others have called anxious politics in Europe. And what is the response to this anxious politics in Europe? We know the features of it, rise of nationalism, of certain kind of uh, thinking around questions of immigration and of race. In January of this year, a group of 30 very famous European intellectuals, consisting, composing of Nobel Prize laureates, and famous writers, and so on, wrote a particular piece that was published in the newspapers in January about Red Europe. They argued that Europe, they say, is unraveling before our very eyes. And then they begin to say that what we need to do is to return to a certain kind of Europe. And to return to a Europe, they argue, in which Europe was an ideal. When I read that particular piece that was published in the, in the English Guardian, I thought to myself of a man called Franz Fanon. And I thought of his Wretched of the Earth, in which he says, let us leave Europe behind because it's been talking about man, but all I see is the butchery and the murder of man. And I thought to myself, okay, what is the Europe, European ideal that we are talking about? That we have had 400 years of a certain kind of colonialism. That you have had the populations who now live in these various European countries who come from these, uh, come from these colonies or whose descendants are people who were born, born in these countries in these colonies. 
that you have had a situation, therefore, where you now have right-wing nationalism, where you have a certain rise of a certain idea of who is European and who is not, or who is not European, which circles around questions of whiteness. How can you begin to think about trying to get back to some kind of different form of living without not thinking about your colonial past? How can you elide that colonial past? How can all these 30 famous people, including Nobel Prize laureates, elide that colonial past by saying that Europe has sometimes made mistakes? 400 years is not a mistake. 400 years is a certain kind of continual historical pattern in which Europe was involved in a certain kind of colonial project. There are some people who have argued, like Macron, for example, from France, that it is now time for some kind of reparative justice. And that reparative justice, he would argue, has to do with the business of returning things, and since we're in a museum, returning things that were taken from colonies and were in Europe, are present in European museums to be actually returned to them. But in Europe, to think about the questions of what I like to call radical decolonization requires certain things. Requires, firstly, the acknowledgement of colonial and racial slavery. But I would argue that acknowledgement is not enough. That you can acknowledge things, historical wrongs, and then just walk off and then just move on. And therefore, what is important is not just an acknowledgement, although that is an important step, but it is also to try and think through what are the set of practices that one must now develop inside societies to deal with the vestiges of the colonial past and of racial past. To think that somehow racial slavery and plantation slavery was over there and not over here is to actually create a false dichotomy. The people who practiced racial slavery and plantations were people who lived in Europe. It was a part of a European historical experience of human beings who resided in Europe. It may have taken geographically and temporally and sorry and spatially over there, but temporally it was happening at the same time. People, there were circulations of people who moved all about between the so-called colonies and the, and the, met and, and the metropole. Therefore, to think that somehow the, the history of Europe is distant and past from this particular 400 years of racial slavery, plantations, and of, col of colonialism is, in my view, to means that we will not be able to grapple with the actual afterlife and consequences of those histories. Because histories have meaning. Histories are not just things about what are not just facts on the ground. Histories are about uh, ways in which human beings create structures, in which those structures have a certain temporal life, in which those structures, ways in which those structures move across time and space and end up shaping the world in which we live today. In thinking about those, those kind of questions, one of the things that we might want to think about is the ways in which we have to acknowledge and pass and develop different practices through a set of societies that are now mired in equality. It is not just America that is mired in equality. It is many societies across the world that have that are worried about equality. Indeed, it is about the ways in which those equalities have generated a set of ideas for a certain nostalgic kind of imaginary idea of what the past constitutes. Let me give you a concrete example, and I'm sorry, this, this example is taken from the United States. I came here on Monday, and Sundays I was packing to come here. On the TV was a medical doctor who had just done a research. And the research he had done was to show that the ways in which white working class in the United States now have a short lifespan than what they had 10, 15 years ago. And when the journalist asked him why he thinks that was so, what are one of some of the reasons, he makes the point that of the certain disappointment of the life for that particular generation between 45 and 54 and how that disappointment has led to 
certain kind of particular areas and the and, and, and the short and life short lifespan. And I then began to think about, therefore, certain kind of elections that happened in the United States three, four years ago. And ways in which, therefore, something like a health situation is in fact deeply rooted in the social. And ways in which, therefore, we can think about, we think about the present as human beings, but always through the mirror and, the, and, and of the mirror of trying to think about the past. And also how, in fact, the past expectations actually shape the present. And so that we have a situation of expectations in which you don't understand the past of being, as being a colonial past, but that somehow it is a golden, this golden age past that does not have anything to do with colonialism and plantation life and slavery and racial slavery. Then what we then get is that that image of the past, of that nostalgia of the past, construct a certain imaginary about what the present should look like and where the problems are. What is it that's stopping me from getting to where I am? At the heart of all of this, I would want to suggest to you, in the contemporary world that we live in, is this question of the human and the planet. If the 1492 voyages of Columbus open a process of human classificator system, then I would want to suggest to you that the processes of radical decolonization proposes something else. That in that human classification system, that we began to distinguish who is human and who is not. And in also doing that, we also began to think about our relationship to this planet that we are all in. That at this moment, to think about this particular question of the ecology of the planet, is also to think about what mode of being human was open in 1492. What kind of ways we thought of ourselves as human beings, not now just in relationship to questions of difference and questions of developing typologies of race, but how we could actually treat the world. And so I would want to end by saying that we, particular, that we stand at a historic point in the history of the human species. And I don't say that like it is something that I think about very, very seriously. Not just because of my son or my grandchildren, but trying to think through where it is that we are as a human, as human, as human beings on this planet, particularly as I travel the planet from Africa to Europe, to the Caribbean, to the United States. I want to suggest that there is a way in which you're thinking about this planet, thinking about the human species, thinking about 1492 and its consequence, means that this business of what we are as human beings is the central question for us to grapple with. It is a question to be grappled with because if we don't answer that particular question in a way that we can begin to live in more human way, humane ways on this planet, then we're all doomed. Thanks very much. So what I'll do is I'll first um, invite Siraj Razul to come up um, to give, and I told him that it must be um, informal and extemporaneous. So don't hold it against him to respond for a few minutes, and then we want to open to a conversation, some question and answers um, that we hope is going to be question and answers, right? A dialogue, and not necessarily just for stats. Um, so while Siraj. Yes, right. Comes. Um, a small answer. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I've just got an open plane. A couple of planes came straight in from Cape Town. So we've got to think about this. Um, and we've just had an extremely powerful presentation 
information about the state we're in and what the, uh, what the questions are that need to concern us um, as we think about legacies of slavery, enslavement, uh, and uh, colonialism and coloniality. And I suppose my task would be to flesh out or to try to make some suggestions to run with the framework and the arguments that Tony has presented to us and to uh, show how right he is, how, how powerfully correct he is, and how that framework can even be extended. Um, and I was reminded, as Tony was making a very important point, that slavery is not just something in the past. It's not just something from a long time ago, but that it is still something that lives with us. I was reminded of a moment, I think it was round about the beginning of <coughs> last year, or maybe when a minor official in the uh, Department of Finance in the British government, in a loose moment, sent out a tweet saying that at last the British government has paid off the loans that it took in order to compensate the slave owners in 1834, when emancipation came in the West Indies, the Cape Colony, Mauritius. And you can imagine the responses to that loose tweet, which was very quickly removed. Because it meant that the people in Britain, including people descended from slaves were paying off that loan until 2017. But what this tells us about is the most powerful work that has been happening in Britain under the leadership of Catherine Wall and others about the records of the compensation and about calculating the finances of exactly who benefited from being compensated for losing their slaves, where, who their names were, where they lived, how they were divided between, say, the Caribbean and, uh, and Britain. And it turns out that Scotland is a major location where slave owners were compensated. And if we think about those legacies and we try and work out the economics of slavery and what those amounts of money would be worth today, it is really worth thinking about. Now, of course, I come from a slave society myself. I'm a child both of the VOC system of slavery at the Cape. And when 15 years ago I came to do research in this museum, of course I think I thought that I came into the records of this museum, I would find the Cape. Well, it was very interesting that I could not find the Cape. The Cape exists in the collections of this museum in a very minor way. Because, of course, the major colonies of the Netherlands were Indonesia and in the Caribbean, Suriname, and so forth. But that does not mean that the kind of history that Tony has outlined to us <coughs> was not experienced at the Cape. 
But there's one added element that I think we need to think about there. The very interesting element that came to us when the British took over first in 1795 and then in 1806. And you remember that was more or less the time that slavery, the, the slave trade was made illegal. And you also had the British anti-slavery squadron in the Atlantic Ocean. A place like St. Helena became important. But already from the late 1700s, the major location from which enslavement was happening in the Atlantic world of slavery was through Mozambique Island in southeastern Africa. And if we look at the map that Tony showed, the UNESCO map, that map is in need of some amending because there are certain histories that that map did not show. It did not show how the Atlantic world was connected to the Indian Ocean world. The slaves, as you know, at the Cape came to some extent from Angola, to some extent from West Africa, substantially from Southeastern Africa, from Madagascar, but in addition to that, it was an Indian Ocean world of slavery. And by the late 1700s, in the early 19th century, that, was that slavery system that came from South Eastern Africa, particularly from Mozambique Island, connected with the Cape. Because that became the major source of slaves for Brazil, for the Caribbean, and even in the United States. From Mozambique Island. And some of those enslaved people ended up at the Cape. Freed by the anti-slavery squadron and ended up at the Cape as free blacks. Now, one of the points that I want to get to is that when the British took over at the Cape, they established an office of the protector of slaves. And as you know, the 19th century was marked by a politics of abolitionism. And when a few years ago Britain went through that magnificent experience of commemorating the ending of slavery, you will know that that was a whole project that many museums in Britain fueled by lottery funds that was all about commemorating abolitionism. One of the things that we have to come to terms with is the politics of abolitionism. And this desire not just to divide the people into races and to determine on the 1500s onwards, as Tony has shown, a distinction between who was human and who was non-human who was a person and who was a thing. But politics began to emerge that placed some people in the position of the protectors, the guardians, the spokespersons, the abolitionists became those who took unto themselves the duty of preservation, the duty of care. And the institutions that we work with, museums, UNESCO, <coughs> come from that abolitionist impetus that eventually gave way to a politics of liberalism and to a politics of trusteeship. 
over people and things. And so when we think of the legacies that we live with, that has turned this history of violence into a governed slave roots project, which would be very interesting to think what UNESCO has done to that history of violence, and turned it into something probably more orderly. I think that when we talk about that transition that Tony has referred to from the Ethiopian to the Negro, Certainly in the case of the British and the experience of African colonialism, there were much finer racial distinctions that came to be made later on that have operated in pernicious ways on the African continent and beyond. Those were the racial distinctions made between so-called Negroes so-called Bantu and so-called Nilotic distinctions that are palpable in a country like Kenya where those kinds of ways of thinking about human beings a classificatory order continue to bedevil East African politics but in the history of enslavement in a country like Brazil it makes a very careful distinction between the qualities of slaves of West African origin and slaves named as Bantu. So those, those distinctions that were made among African people was one of the ways in which African people came to be ruled. But we need another distinction, and that is in our South African history of colonialism, a further distinction needs to be made. That some people were colonized through race, other people were colonized through ethnicity. In general, it's, it's, it's an argument that I've been working with. And it's, it's already just the last two weeks of research that I've been doing in Berlin on how the Germans were collecting human remains of the colonial battlefields in the 19th century in Southern Africa. In general, Khoisan people were colonized by race and Bantu-speaking people were colonized by ethnicity, turned into tribes, governed through a system of native administration, <coughs> which was also propelled by an idea of trusteeship and the friends of the natives of speaking on behalf of those who were unable to govern themselves. But as we think about this history of slavery and the way it has continued to press upon societies, and as we notice how the debate about these legacies has intensified on college campuses in the United States in struggles over how we reckon histories of universities as being so powerfully formed out of slavery and violence. I need to tell you about an important project that I think does begins to do the kind of work that Tony suggests needs to be done. And that is the work done in the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama at the lynching museum and memorial where a very powerful argument is made about the direct connection 
between slavery and racial terrorism and mass incarceration in the United States, where there are contemporary features of that slave system of slavery and violence that continue to exist today. And there you have a powerful presentation of an argument about what the national history of the United States is composed of. But that is not just an argument about the, the history of the United States. That, as Tony has shown us, is the history of modernity. And so I think we need to be careful when we, when we decide to focus on humanity and humaneness, that we don't do so through what abolitionism has bequeathed to us. Because then we repeat the crimes of slavery. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so I want to open up um, a discussion now. Um, and perhaps not to answer my own question, but to answer your question. Um, as I said to you before, much of this is about inserting these arguments within a public discourse and discussion around what the afterlife of slavery is um, today in the structure of contemporary world. But it also is about informing how we develop an exhibition into the future. So um, Tony raised several important points. Um, the relationship, I think, um, that, that emerged first in that transition from thinking difference according to um, religion to thinking difference um, around questions of race, around questions of phenotype, around questions of the body. And in that structuring of the human, the relationship between slavery, colonialism, and how we understand um, capitalism today, but also the relationship between slavery and, 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 creation and, and questions of modernity. This ties to ongoing discussions with other scholars who also see that relationship between the racializing hierarchies that we that, that in um, structure our present and a particular kind of colonial past. Siraj and Tony ended nicely and thankfully with the question of the museum and its implicated. I want to come back to that conversation around implicatedness at the end. Siraj um, spoke about questions not necessarily only on race but on ethnicity, um, as well as a caution around a particular kind of ab abolitionist governance that is patronizing, caring, but actually emerged into what the museum has become in terms of custodianship and a way of telling others how to be in the world. Tony, first to you. Siraj's response was also a response from a, another kind of specificity, because yours, in many ways, emerged with a lot of work through Caribbean thought and Caribbean scholarship. And Siraj comes with a located um, from South Africa. And what that meant. I wonder if you want to take some of that up and perhaps to ask the question because there are scholars in the room who work, for example, on Indian Ocean State. What do you say? Does that specificity challenge your thesis? Would thinking, for example, from the Indian Ocean strengthen challenge what you're trying to do? And how might we bring them together in a conversation? Yeah, I mean, this, I, I don't think the scholarship on the Indian Ocean slavery 
uh, challenges fundamentally what I'm trying to say. Uh, the point I think to that makes is that part of the Indian Ocean slavery actually ends up in the Brazil. Cape Town, Cape becomes a part of in a way that you don't, you don't normally think about. So that, for me, what you're looking at is a, is, a, is really a change of speculation of a world <coughs> a system that moves um, from different parts of Africa, um, you know, around the Cape, into particularly the southern Africa, um, into, for sure, for present, which is the, you know, which is the, the, the epicenter, quite frankly, in the so-called Atlantic world of the Portuguese and the Dutch. Okay, so I don't think I don't think it does. I think what it does is that it says to us that we cannot think about the system only in Atlantic terms. That we have to think about the system, I like to call it, we can't think about the system in 50%. We have to think about the system in a, in, in a hundred percent. And uh, my discussion with colleagues in North South Africa when we think about the Indian Ocean is that quite frankly some colleagues just think about the, the Indian Ocean and the, and the Atlantic world. But I keep on saying to folks, listen, if you were following the Portuguese, Right, who you have to follow because they were the first and the most important um, slave, you know, slave traders, then you will see they don't make those kind of distinctions that we are we actually make. And they, they move. Right? And they move wherever they think they have to they, 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 they have to go to. So that it's it, it, it is important I think to to connect the two. Um, what is not connected and this is much more difficult than I didn't speak about it. Uh, today, because you know that, that's the, the next phase of some of the work I'm trying to do, is to think about the Arab slave trade. To actually, think about the slave trade from Africa that goes that goes up into uh, into what we now call the Middle East, and to, to think about that and the consequences of that um, for thinking about slavery itself. What what is clear to me, though, in the, in, in the oh, thank you very much. Actually, really. What is clear to me in, 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 in this though is that the, the question of difference, which in my view becomes the, and the question of the racial typologies, is something that is connected deeply to the actual, both the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean slave trade. That, that's, that, that, that is clear to me. In other words, in the Arab slave trade, People called the Africans who were enslaved all sorts of names. They consider them barbarians, whatever. But there was the, 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 the moment, the historic, <coughs> what one is trying to point to is what is the turn in human history or in all modernity in which, quite frankly, phenotype becomes the marker. Of, of special characteristics. And that phenotype is that, therefore, if you are black, you are a slave. And if you are white, you cannot be slave. And if you watch the, if you track two things, if you track the, the passage of the Virginia laws from 1611 onwards, in which black folks and white folks who are from Ireland and from Scotland and so on, were all indentured servants. And then just map how that indentured servitude then began to be rearranged around color and around phenotype. So that in the end, the, the white servant from indentured servant from Scotland or from India, because you know America was a British colony, we tend to forget that, right? um, was in fact could not be a slave. And how, in fact, black slaves, there are court cases that I've looked at, restaurant records, of black folks who were free and in the, as indentured servants, who now became slaves and now had to now go to court to try and argue that they were not slaves, they are free. Right? But that the law, in fact, has, has switched on them in the middle of their lives. So that it, it's, it's, trying to, it's trying to think through those, those, those moments and actually remapping it earlier 
to quite frankly the indigenous population and, the, and what the Jesuits, what all my Jesuit friends wrote about these indigenous uh, pe people and how they began to do this business of human classification system which then gets taken up in the alignment and if you hear me talking a lot about this is because I've just finished looking at a book by a very important philosopher about enlightenment now and uh, uh, it argues that the enlightenment was the was the most the most important thing in human this history and what we now need is return to that all right and i keep on asking that you keep on have you forgotten that it is the, the enlightenment as a way of thinking about classificatory things actually is, a, is, a, is invented racial typologies so it's, it's trying to think through those those kind of questions so all right um, i want to have more questions myself but i want to refer to it to you question <coughs> Uh, hello. So recently, at the at my university, the University of Amsterdam, the, to celebrate uh, International Women's Day, uh, there was one organization which specifically was celebrating sort of the integration of women into the workplace and celebrating female CEOs, and. I was wondering, and, and so for me, this kind of shows how the sort of struggle of uh, women who have been historically a marginalized group has sort of been integrated with uh, in, into capitalism and the general sort of liberal discourse. And uh, slavery and sort of co co the race, race and colonialism, which is something that uh, helped birth capitalism in, in the first place, um, I, I was wondering if perhaps it would be a possibility in the future if uh, sort of the struggle of marginal of people who were previously marginalized by racism and colonialism and all these structures to be accommodated within the capital within capitalism, or if these are two fundamentally opposing sort of ways of thinking that cannot be accommodated at all. Can I just pass the second question behind you? Hi. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I was very interested in sort of the legacies of custodianship, and especially sort of now with all the debates about uh, return of cultural objects, so um, in the National Museum of World Cultures, um, sort of those two things linked together, because it seems to be that there is still a tension where there is um, who sort of decides which objects are going back and for what reasons. So I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on that. First, these two, and then we we'll go to two more. Yeah, in response to the first question, and then I leave the second question to Saraj. Um, <laughs> no, I can answer, but I, he raised this uh, properly. He should answer. Um, what you raised is a very important question. Let me try and be as brief as possible. But it's also a fairly complex question. Part of the liberalism that emerges in the 19th century is around questions of, rep of representation. So what you get in the, late in the 20th and 21st century is the way in which questions of representation are mapped onto questions of rights and political equality primarily and integration. One of the strengths of the dominant system that we live under to use the phrase of the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci, is hegemony. It's his capacity for hegemony. And one of the ways in which hegemony works is that it has the capacity to capture things and reorganize it and, re and, and turn it into something else. Let me just give you a concrete example that sticks in my mind and let me uh, lead me down this path. I'm walking in Times Square, I've just come to the United States, I'm a Jamaican, I have a job at this university, I'm trying to see what New York lives look like. I see Bob Marley, I'm with a Jamaican, I'm overjoyed. Bob Marley, I look closely, and what, uh, what do I see? Bob Marley and the question about um, the word is love. And this is all in maps. And I think about, my God, okay, okay, okay. Pull back, Tony, pull back. Because 
my happiness to see Bob Marley in Times Square as a Jamaican. I know what I see is a is a cutting of what Rastafari and what Marley represent. Right? And all I see is love. Right? Not nothing about Babylon, nothing about fighting the system, not nothing this is a godless Marley, right? With, with Rastaman Rastaman blocks. And so that the, it struck me that this this, this capacity to, to to take ideas, to take a Martin Luther King and put him on a postal stamp, but to but not to talk about Martin Luther King's last set of speeches about war, militarism, and capitalism is in fact one of the ways in which the system the system works. So that if you take it, if you take it, if you try to think about the argument that I'm making, this is the way I, I think the, uh, my argument works. That what you have is that when you have the con you have a you have a construction of certain black figures that I would like to call sometimes Negro exceptionalists. And that Negro exceptionalist is able to find his or her way within the actual system itself. But th that is an exception. And that exception then is saying, okay, if you all behave, if you all go to Harvard, if you all go to this, if you all do this, and so on, then you can actually succeed in the system. That the heart of the system, of the liberal system, is its capacity to open up and to include. The heart of the liberal system is a certain, it's not that, it's a capacity for it to hegemony, to grab and rework, and to take ideas that will seem to be good ideas for living a better life, and to turn them into, into something else. And it's the same thing with the women's movement. In other words, feminism has a certain, has emerged as a certain radical form and edge to it to me about not just thinking about gender and sexuality, but thinking about the way in which society is organized. But as soon as you begin to talk about questions only of representation, and only begin to see representation as a certain kind of civil right, rather than seeing, in my view, the fundamental question, which is that of foundational inequalities inside a society, then you are you, you then you then you are into problem. Because the problem is not representation. That's part of the problem. And I will always fight for, for representation. But that's part of the problem. The real problem is the structures of the way in which a society is organized that is grounded around questions of, in, of, of, in, of really tremendous inequality, but also fundamentally of who's human and, who, and, who, and who's not. That, to me, require not, requires not liberalism, but requires another form of thinking through a certain kind of radical uh, some kind of magic of a radical, radical project, and for me, I call it a radical project of of, of, um, of equality and a radical project of common association. Um, I mean, what what what, um, what Tony has shown very clearly is how the conventional model that we have of the, the kind of historicist stages of development of society from feudalism to capitalism marked by free labor it is in fact, I mean it needs to be rethought. Capitalism shows itself to be uh, entirely amenable to absorbing, coexisting with other forms of uh, labor, of unfree labor, and uh, I mean that is, I mean, you know, the work of Walter Rodney and, and Emmanuel Wallerstein and others show, shows very powerfully how, how that is the case, and, and later on in the emergence of uh, uh, African peasantries and migrant labor, as a specific colonial labor form, uh, just shows how there is no singular capitalism, but capitalism that coexists with other forms of of, of labor, and, and and that persists. And it is precisely those hybrid issues that bedevil 
national liberation movements who sometimes think their task is to create a capitalism based on free labor in an independent state and to think in developmentalist logics uh, like neoliberalism might. Um, of course, I think we are living through a very long transition from the modern museum out of all of its dilemmas and its contradictions uh, and as a, 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 a fundamental an institution of colonialism, uh, of, of a modernity that is marked by colonialism, let us put it that way. And I, I, I very much liked the distinction, the 16th century distinction that Tony shows was being made between uh, around question who, who, who belonged to nature and who was human. Because therein also lies the history of the institutions that of modernity that has emerged to care for nature and to preserve nature, to preserve biodiversity. And it's been interesting that in the last few months I find myself on the end of the phone with like the journalist from Europe or a radio station in Chicago trying to get out of me this idea or, or try to get me to challenge me on this question of whether natural history is, is colonial. Whether the Natural History Museum is a colonial museum. Isn't it just like devoid of politics? Isn't it just like animals and plants? And of course the Natural History Museum is the Ur Museum. And ethnography <coughs> collections and museums emerge as a subset of the Natural History Museum. And that is why we cannot leave the Natural History Museum um, unchallenged. Now, the transition that we are experiencing in our bubble of time, which is going to be a short time, and it's, we, we, it's, it's quite heightened. We're going through a fast-paced, heightened set of processes here, accelerations perhaps, of from the uh, the modern museum, the collecting museum, the museum of custodianship, the museum of stewardship, to one where we are going to think about the museum in very different terms. Very different terms. The museum is about social relations. The museum is about participation. And whatever that is, the seeds of it might be expressed here and there in different kinds of museum projects. But right now, we have to participate and help to accelerate this moment of restitution, this moment of return. We don't yet know what it's going to mean. We don't know because alongside that, this moment of restitution has to be a process of epistemic reconsideration because we can't keep artifacts in their same epistemologies as we change their geographic location. This is not just about the morality of where objects must be, must be, must be kept. But this is about what kinds of institutions, what kinds of citizenship are we talking about beyond a citizenship that is instructional and that is about the relationship between people and objects and everyone knowing their place. These are the, these are the cutting edge debates and we're only at a certain stage. But it is a long process and it's going to, it's going to uplift us. And I think we are very privileged to be, to be part of this moment, a very important moment of acceleration um, in this, this, this history, which is, which is part of the questioning of Abolitionism. I want to make that point. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I think we should take account very much of, of bringing these two conversations together. Right? That, 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 to be able to think the question of the human is also to be able to think the question of what restitution is and might do. Right? 
And um, if any of you would have read the, the, the French report that I already mentioned, that at stake in that report as well, is not just a conversation about giving things back. It's a conversation about re reinaugurating how we can understand what heritage is, who, who, and also that to, to try and think again about how to undo, think otherwise about the kinds of framework that colonialism has become. So bringing these two conversations together, I think is central to the project that we speak about. Dan, and I'll take another question to you. Um, hi, Suraj. Hi, Professor Lewis. Um, I'm confused. Um, I'm thinking about um, what the Professor said about racial slavery created the Negro. And then you, Siraj, said um, colonization through race and ethnicity. And I'm currently doing some research on the Kotomesi from Suriname, and doing some research on Surinamese history. And in that research, I noticed that what you said, uh, Professor Rose, is that um, ma marriage between black men and white women was not allowed. Not married. Uh, OK, relationships, yeah. Uh, but um, the other way around, uh, it was quite allowed I, as well in my research is to see um, black women and white men. So how does then the construction of the Negro, uh, how does that um, integrate also uh, the gender, actually? All right, another question um, there is uh, Rita at the back. And then after that, we have these last two questions because I think we have ten. Right. Quick question, quick answers. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, yes, hello. Um, first of all, thank you very much both for your, your uh, presentation argument. But what, what I see is like these different constructions that are happening at the same, same time you know, in different uh, colonial spaces. So it's just a comment. Respond, respond first, otherwise, they don't want to Sorry, Yeah, let me just respond to the first question. What is interesting is that the law also talks about um, no, there should be no intercourse, the slave laws, between black women and white men. But slavery, and I, I'm thinking this, slavery is also a, a patriarchal society, which means what? Which means that? And I mean, in my head, as I was saying that, describing that law, I had a thing that said, yeah, but a lot of people didn't obey that part of the law. But, you know, because, but I, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't, I just didn't say it. But it was actually in my head uh, as I was saying it. Um, so that, yes, you, you, what you're pointing to is to patriarchal, patriarchal relations. Um, and uh, the, the, the emergence of so called mulattoes, if you to use that horrible word, um, you know, is, is, the, is the evidence of, of, of that. And therefore, um, it is, what is interesting is that white planters or white men could do, could get away with it and would not be, would not be branded. Because if you're a white woman, you would be branded. I mean, just think, you know, um, and if you're not white, then if you're not married, then you'd be whipped and then banned from the colony. But all of that didn't matter if you were, if you were a man, right? So yes, uh, I mean, I think it's important to to think through um, slavery, uh, through the questions of gender and, 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 and patriarchy, right? And, and thank you for that because it allowed me to, you know, it allowed me to, 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 to make that. And in fact, you don't. My argument is that you don't quite get the other foot, other leg of the argument is that fact that you don't quite get. Uh, to understand the relations of domination within slavery, and understand the relations of patriarchy as well, and how that works and saturates our society. Okay, so thanks for that. In relationship to the second question, um, there is a there is there is always historical specificity um, around these questions of blackness, um, and it's always difficult, quite frankly, in a talk of forty-five minutes to to kind of go through every single historical specificity. What I'm trying to, to, to point to 
in very broad stroke general terms is the way in which um, in the way is the way in which blackness and whiteness actually structural in fact those specificities themselves um, so that in in um, I'm thinking of one particular place in um, in, uh, in Haiti you know you can also think of Brazil in this way um, but on a French um, French domination in Saint Domingue there were 128 definitions of color. One, two, eight, if you can think about that. But the, all of that is a gradation that has to do with blackness right up to whiteness. And, and, and uh, who is in that and who is not in that also depends on a whole set of other things inside society. But my point is about a, a general reframing of difference to then begin to think about phenotype. That's my main point. Um, historical specificities will always abound. It didn't happen here like this, it didn't, this didn't happen, that didn't happen, and so on. And the nuances of history are what make history so, quite frankly, very interesting. But there is a way in which one has to also think about what frames are being created. The, the word that Foucault would use is what is the horizons that have been created in which we then begin to live and begin to think about a certain questions. So thanks very much for the point, but you know, um, and it's something I would, I would, I would think about. <coughs> Thank you very much. That's a nice presentation. Maybe I have a short comment and maybe a question. Maybe the comment is a question too. Uh, I'm a little bit baffled in that sense. Uh, I find it very humorous. You, know, you mentioned uh, a scholar, uh, Portuguese, I believe, who a Jesuit, uh, who was writing some ridiculous stuff. Now the question is, uh, obviously if you look at it, one could question if this was how the impact of this maybe writing, scholarly writing, I don't know how to classify it, if it did have an impact when talking about the European press, okay? Uh, that, that's maybe the comment or maybe the question. Uh, at this point, my interest is mainly in uh, economic <coughs> development and the colonial period. Economic or development and colonial period. Uh, and uh, I'm increasingly <coughs> beginning to, to realize that maybe what we are calling uh, now the European Enlightenment is a wrong type of uh, way of looking at what happened uh, in, in, in history and how societies developed. And this brings us to the question if it would make sense, if you look at the, the mess we have these days with, let's say, uh, economic development and so on. It would be, make sense to, to reconsider this concept of uh, enlightenment when we relate it to the human <coughs> Thank you. Um, I just have a question um, um, about the notion of custodianship in combination with or looking at it through um, the notion of uh, epistemological or epistemic violence, would it not be fair to, in looking at um, museums as spaces where artifacts have traditionally been um, kept, ripped away from their traditional context, would it not be fair to regard museums as spaces of epistemic violence? Like, how, how do you deal with that notion? Try and do very quickly so that uh, <coughs> Dr. Wallace can wrap up. Um, for clarity, the Portuguese person I was talking about was an entrepreneur who had business all over the world in, 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 uh, in India, Bengali, um, in, uh, in the Brazil, in <laughs> Lisbon, uh, <coughs> sorry, um, and, and, and in Africa, and was involved with it. really. There was Jose Pereira. Um, that's who I was talking about and trying to take to take him as a figure. And I'm talking to a Brazilian colleague who's working on a, a biography of him and trying to trying to think through about what does he, you know, what does he represent in terms of the actual world system itself. Uh, and he also has relations with Dutch and American entrepreneurs. 
single general individual entrepreneur. He was he was quite a figure. Um, the, the people the, who are the writings I was quoting from the 1500s and so are uh, Jesuit priests who have been to the New World. Um, and were they popular? They were popular amongst the elite reading Euro European public. Um, and they were also, and what is interesting is that um, they were popular in terms not of reading public but of speeches. In other words, these are priests who, are, who actually gave sermons regularly. So that therefore people heard, a lot of people heard of what, what they were saying. And in fact, one of them, um, uh, in his own treatise against slavery, was, uh, was about, although he was actually had a work racial typology in his head, and his classifications gave very, uh, a lot of people came to hear him speak all the way. And he was from, he was, his um, parish was in Cartagena in Colombia. Uh, with a great following. So that is how um, people, <coughs> people hear what it is that people, you know, what some of these, uh, what some of these people are thinking. Um, and the Enlightenment um, is a big, it's a big question. Um, you know, there's not, you know, there's not one Enlightenment, there's a Scottish Enlightenment, there's a French Enlightenment, uh, you know, etc. Uh, but we just drop it, you know, we all call it, uh, call it Enlightenment. I think that the, <coughs> one of the key things about whatever the Scottish, whatever, um, you know, uh, French, whoever, uh, whatever country and I you want to call it, one of the key things is uh, the emergence of a certain call, a certain kind of quote unquote scientific rationality. Okay? Um, and that emergence of a certain kind of scientific rationality, which then begins to map entire human experience around certain kind of quote unquote scientific forms. Um, and scientific frames. I think um, I think it's deeply problematic itself, if you, if you want me to if you put it that way. Um, it because what it what it does is that it it essentially it it see, it, go, it's, it it leads to the emergences of what we call in the academy social science. It leads to the emergence of something a something like economics. It then leads to a certain conception of us as human beings, as uh, where you can map our behavior according to certain kind of so-called scientific norms that the law of gravity <coughs> must come down, right? That sort of thing. So you take you take natural, you can kind of take physics, the laws particularly of physics, and then you try to map those onto physics and the way the human universe, the universe, not just the planet, the universe is constructed. And you then try and map those laws onto human, onto human behavior. I think that that's a particular, I think that creates a lot of fantasy. Let me, let me just put it that way. <coughs> Before I come to this question of epistemic violence, I just want to go back to some of the questions that our colleague raised about the nomenclatures of, of race and um, and how you can see differences but connections between different racial systems and how these categories get used and how they shift. I think in noting those arrangements and those similarities and differences, one has to have an argument and a need to intervene in uh, the persistence of racial systems and, and where um, uh, the Cape in South Africa is quite a pernicious place. The Cape was the only part of South Africa that experienced slavery. Uh, the, uh, the Cape later on under apartheid had a special <coughs> that prevented so-called African people from entering the camp. It had a special law called colored labor preference. And so today, in, in the Western Cape, there is a practice of a kind of slave mentality where colored people vote for their former, former oppressors. It's very, and, and, and it, it, 
where there is a belief that African people do not belong in Cape Town, are foreigners. Today there's even, you know, as this kind of coloredness gets morphed into a kind of indigeneity of a reclaimed Khoisa ancestry, there's even an argument that, you know, African people are foreigners. They are Congolese who recently came to, to Cape So one of the arguments about <coughs> Uh, these histories of slavery is to precisely to be able to point out how African colored people are. And with, with, that, with, with, with those distinctions being, being, being quite problematic. Uh, secondly, it's also important to point out how these categories of African and Black have operated not as, as points of unity and not as racial categories, as those who would know Afrikaans would know that Afrikaans does not have a word for African. And you will know that when I speak Afrikaans, a Dutch person will tell me, Jij spreekt Shade Afrikaans, because Dutch has a meaning of Afrikaans which is different to the South African meaning of Afrikaans. Those peculiarities are important because it's, it, it, especially in these days after the end of apartheid where we have a re-racialization of the category of black, it is very important to go back to the desires of the black consciousness movement and how it inaugurated, in a sense, a non-racial political politicized uh, category of blackness that one needs to go back to. And it is also the, 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 the category African was inaugurated as a political identity of unity and not as a category of racial administration. And so when we, when we think about these differences and similarities, we need to understand those, 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 those histories. Now, of course, um, custodianship and, and uh, care and, and uh, stewardship is not just of things, but of the forms of knowledge about things. So custodianship is always uh, not just for the thing, but for the classificatory order. And of course, that is epistemic violence. But the more one looks at epistemic violence <coughs> and the history of collective, the more it also becomes apparent that it was accompanied by actual violence. And one of the things that is, in, is, is, is happening more and more now as we think about these questions is we're becoming so aware of how how much we have occluded actual violence in favor of epistemic violence. And when we go back to human remains collecting and of uh, <coughs> collecting of ethnographic objects and how sometimes these occurred together and how these got separated from each other in a society such as Germany just through discipline and through the creation of different kinds of museums, then it is, it, is, it is easy to forget just how violent the museum's history is. And this is important. And I mean, the Germans are aware of this, and that is why they give so much money for Provenance Forschung. But they don't do the Provenance Forschung back in time to the point of collecting, because it could be too. Uh, destabilizing for the objective. I like it too. This has been a, a wonderful conversation that comes, actually comes nicely back to why we even do these conversations here and why we had Professor Gold here with us. I mean, at scale in, in these kinds of conversations is also what is the space that this museum <coughs> these histories map onto our collections, our practices, but also what are we going to do with it? What is at stake? 
Ms. Alex said I wanted to end with implicatedness, primarily because I want to also end this part of the program <coughs> by thinking about how we eat together. And this is what we do here at RCMC, actually think about how we together respond to something that Professor Bowles ended with, how we together can fashion other possible horizons. That is something that I think is urgent. If anything else, I would suggest that if it is patriarchy, if it is ethnicity, if it is racism, <coughs> and all under the umbrella of colonialism, colonialism, one is sure that the structuring dynamics that led to how we as institutions work are actually structured very much in these dynamics with our question. And so I want to thank you both. Thanks, Professor Bo. Thanks for being with us for a while. And actually, we have more with you because he's going to do a master class tomorrow. Um, so if you, you are all welcome to that as well. And Siraj is our ongoing friend, so he's here. Professor Bo. national, um, European, or global. And then we open, we close with a discussion that will include all of us. Thank you. So five minutes, please, no. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 